Born in Oak Park, Illinois. Then at the age of one, we moved to a house that Dad was building. Uh, his first, one of his first houses. He designed it in Long Beach, Indiana. Dad had uh, lots of clients there. He was a kind of town architect without being hired by the town. In other words, he did the city hall, he did the schoolhouse, and he designed a number of things. And then another architect moved into town, and Dad lost the country club, which was a bitter blow to him. Uh, it was all politics, and Dad was not a very good politician, um, although he gave a great deal of his life to wherever he lived as a community person, and I learned that from my father. He did what architects should be doing, participating in the community. And, uh, and I think we have to learn that somewhere. It's a hard lesson to learn because it's becoming much more complicated now than it ever has been. It was a very wealthy community, and I didn't realize till I was 11 or 12 when I saw my first black person. And I said to my mother, we were down in Michigan City, I said, does he have a disease? Mother said, no, those are black Negroes. And I said, well, I've never seen one before. No, she said, we don't allow them in our town, our community. And of course, I became a, ma a radical immediately. <laughs> I had no idea about exclusion because we were included in everything, you see. Exclusion comes when you have diversity and you see it. Otherwise, you have no way of knowing what is exclusion unless you see it. Uh, you can be told it, you can read about it, but you have to see it. And I think it's why I'm so radical, and I am radical when I get anywhere where there's no thoughtful crowd. Uh, so I wanted to go to a very good school. I wanted, I wanted to see, well, I didn't want to live in a community like that, and never have. I wanted to be a quantum physicist. <laughs> and I wanted to see what the, the deep blue beyond was all about. And, uh, I was fascinated with physics, and I was out on the hill one night doing my calculations. I was always doing calculations of constellations, and I had a little, I even had a little telescope, as I remember, uh, and I came in from the hill and said to my mother, well, that's out, and I think I was about maybe 14, 13, 14. She said, what's out? My mother was a Swedish woman from Sweden, and a uh, very wise woman. She was not an intellectual, but she was a very wise, sound woman. And she said, well, uh, what happened? And I said, I cannot grasp the concept of infinity. I will never grasp the concept of infinity. I will not believe the point nine nine equal one, and therefore I cannot be a physicist. And my mother said, I see. <laughs> well, what will you be then? Because in those days you had to be something. I said, I've been thinking about it. And I said, I think I'll be an architect. And my mother in her marvelous witty manner said, oh, how original. <laughs> And I didn't get it at all. I mean, I, I knew that my uncle was, and my grandfather was, and my father was, and, and they were full of architects everywhere. It took a number of years before I saw how that transpired. I think I'm, yes, yeah, somewhat pragmatic. Mm -hmm. I think that comes from having seen a lot. Uh, I've traveled very widely. Uh, and in order to do what I've done, I've had to walk around a lot of things, a lot of issues, a lot of people, a lot of places. Uh, 
And if I hadn't done that, because I'm naturally curious, I want to know, uh, I would have gotten myself even more off track rather than justify the tracks that I have gotten off on. And I can justify almost all of them. I had an experience when I was 44 that was interesting. And I, again, I don't think it's emotional, but I was on my way to on a grant to Germany. And I thought, well, I'm going to stop over in Pennsylvania and see falling water. I'd never seen falling water. And uh, uh, quite a few of Granddad's works that I haven't seen. And so I stopped to see falling water. And the uh, curator was there. And it wasn't a public day, so he said, Liz, you can look around. And I walked into that living room. I don't know what hit me, but it was just extraordinary. My God, what a building. And I, can, can you say it was an emotional response? I, maybe it was, but you know, I looked because I was immediately translating what I was feeling to my own life. I mean, there was no transition at all because I walked through the whole thing and I was by myself, and uh, uh, I thought, well, here you are. 44 years old, you're on your way to Europe. We'd done a lot of work, and my husband and I were fighting all the time on, on architecture. It was architecture. We, Jesus, it was really fights on how we would handle the architecture. And, uh, and I was unhappy with what I was doing. I was doing derivative work. I had, a, you know, my father was an architect, my grandfather was an architect, my God, I had all the corner windows and the big long overhangs and the whole thing was there, you see. And, uh, and I always thought it was rather original. And I realized the minute I saw Falling Water that uh, I had been competing with my grandfather. And what the hell was I doing competing with Frank Lloyd Wright? I mean, piece of lunacy. <laughs> you know, I said to myself, walking through the falling water, yeah, this is as good as it gets, God Almighty, and you can't do this. You do good work, you're very good, you're excellent, but you can't do this. <laughs> and why are you competing with this guy? And so I went to Europe, uh, and said, very firmly committed from that time on to finding my own vernacular. I spoke up at uh, Milwaukee a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, I saw, I got to the hotel up there, and they just have that one hotel, and the desk clerk came to me. I'd driven up to Chicago after taking a plane to Chicago, and, and he said, oh, he said, Ms. Ingram, we have you in Calatrava's room. Well, I didn't know who the hell Calatrava was. I mean, I, I, is he, I said, is he the bridge designer? And he said, oh yes, but you want to see this. And I thought, how long has it been Liz, since a desk clerk has suggested that you go see a piece of architecture? I said, maybe never. <laughs> and so I was dead tired, but I stalked up the hill there from the Metro Hotel. and. I was stunned, absolutely stunned. I couldn't believe it. I thought, who, who, who is this guy? And so I came back, and the next day, the curator from the museum took me through the whole thing. And uh, it wasn't yet finished. They didn't have the thing moving in and out. Uh, the, so I have never seen that yet. Uh, so. I just said, well, this, this is a marvel. I mean, this man is, is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I was stunned and uh, forever a uh, believer in what he was doing, if you uh, have to be that. I, mean, I, I follow him pretty closely. I follow Richard Rogers pretty closely. I follow uh, Cam. Uh, Ram Coolhouse pretty closely, but I don't like what he did at the Illinois Institute of Technology at all. 
I don't know what he was thinking of. I just have no idea, and I told him so. So, <laughs> and, uh, but I have seen things that I like of his. Uh, I think uh, uh, Renzo Piano is brilliant. Uh, Uzan is brilliant. Uh, we have a lot of very wonderful architects, you know. Uh, we have a lot of very wonderful thinking people. In a fragmented society, which we have, the whole integrated Renaissance kind of idea is lost, not practiced. My grandfather used to say the trouble with architecture is architects. And I think that's probably true. On the other hand, everybody's caught, including education, in fragmentation. Because fragmentation is economically possible. Integration is expensive as hell. Because you have to include vision, you have to include all kinds of things, which there's no money for and no interest in because of our educational system which starts in kindergarten. And so, you know, if you cannot integrate and move without placing in front of every born child the fact that they have to know their addition and subtraction uh, before a certain time in their life, You've killed it all in the beginning. I mean, you can't do it that way. You've got to do, I'm sorry to say, what the Germans and the Japanese do. And that is that they spend the first two years in teaching cooperation in the schools at the age of first grade and second grade. They, imagine that. They teach, a co teach cooperation. Uh, what a splendid way to get all the best out of all the knowledge that's around you. Cooperation, uh, and and we don't teach it. And you know, I want to say maybe it's the fault of the Bill of Rights. They were all individuals, but I think consider that a really major force for good. Is that individuals uh, are recognized? And lately, because I've been so upset over what's happening in this country. And I, like millions of others, don't know what to do about it. First, you ought to work on courage. <laughs> you have to have courage to be an architect, uh, to do a good job of it. You have to have courage. And you have to be willing uh, to get your outreach beyond where people will put you. Architects are one of the few disciplines that cross boundaries very easily. Architects are wonderful. They cross boundaries. And it's a diminishing profession. It's hard to take because the kind of training they've been getting is incredible. I mean, it's, a, it's the start of a re Renaissance type life if they would just see it that way. But the world is all fragmented. And it's getting worse. And this country's fragmented, and we're getting worse. I think an overtime effort to have more knowledge on everything, a real effort to get knowledge. I love doing libraries because that's free knowledge. The libraries are full of people who have no computers at home. They come from the libraries to find out how to run computers. Libraries are really pushed these days. They've got thousands of people in them. And uh, it's free knowledge, so you have no excuse not to have knowledge. And they'll find any damn book you want for you. If they have to get it from Europe, they'll find it. It's an unbelievable institution, the library. Unbelievable. Educational institutions, I think they're the toughest place to be. I think being in education nowadays,
teachers, professors, it's the toughest place to be. Because you're raised and educated with the idea of, of teaching. And the odds against anything sinking in are getting pretty bad. The architects in my book have all the ingredients. I happen to believe that. They have all the necessary ingredients for being major contributors to society. And I don't know anybody who doesn't have a kind of a acknowledgement that architects are kind of important. They don't know what they do, of course, but uh, they like the idea of an architect. That, that has some sort of uh, status to it in our society. I watch my apartment building. I'm the status symbol for the building. I am the status symbol. And they use it to sell apartments. And uh, I asked them once, is this an ethical thing for you to be doing? They said, we don't know, but it works. <laughs> I had the gift of enormous energy. Enormous energy. I never sat down. I worked all the time. Uh, I drafted, designed with kids on my back, hanging in a pouch in the back, at my feet. I learned how to multitask very efficiently. I started all sorts of organizations. I had all sorts of kudos to my credit. And my husband was drinking more and more. And I said, be careful, Gordon, I'm getting stronger. And I was. Uh, but I had the energy. Um, if you don't have the energy, Sonia, it's tough. It's tough. You have to have energy. I just had lunch with a couple of girls yesterday, and uh, they said they just ran out of energy when they got to be 70. And um, I seem to explode with it. And so I suppose I must take my hat off to some genetics, which were in there getting things in the right place. At the age of 70, I, I decided that uh, I'd go back and take physics at IIT in Chicago, where I had studied with Mies van der Rohe. And uh, they would accept me. I, I, matter of fact, they were dying to get me back there. And uh, Myron Goldsmith was going to be my, my uh, mentor. And then I got a huge job <laughs> at architectural. And I thought, no, no, I, I love doing architecture. <laughs> I guess I'm not going to go and suddenly become a physicist at the age of 70. So I never went back. But I'm fascinated with science, absolutely fascinated with it. Science is, a, is the book of knowledge for me. And I am devoted to it. Uh, I realize that we have a long ways to go, but it just seems an absolute... In other words, if you're hunting for a messiah, and I tell this to all my Jewish friends, if you're hunting for a messiah, look at the world of ideas. It's there. It's not in a person. Look at the ideas that have manifest themselves and uh, go to work on them. <laughs>